Welcome to season one of Steve G. Jones Hypnosis. And what we're going to do is we're going to take my cleaning person, who's Sarah. She's also a friend of mine. And I'm also friends with her ex-husband, Jonathan. And we're going to uh, use her as a case study and she's going to benefit from it as well. She's going to uh, get some free hypnosis sessions. Uh, she's going to get to get to the heart of some of the challenges that she's having because here's what's going on. Sarah is constantly complaining about money. It's just a constant situation. For example, she'll, she'll come in to clean for me and she'll say, I need $3,000. And of course, she doesn't make that much cleaning per week. She makes uh, about $80 a week cleaning. So she'll say, I need $3,000. And I'll say, why? She'll say, because my air conditioning went out. And uh, I'll, I'll say, well, I, I wish I could help you, but I really don't have uh, you know, that much cleaning for you. So this sort of thing keeps happening. Sarah talking about money. Sarah talking about a gap between where she is and where she wants to be financially. So I thought, well, what a beautiful case study this would be. If we could take Sarah, of all people, and get her from where she is to where she wants to be, and if we can come along for the ride. Because a lot of times people have challenges in their lives and they don't realize that other people are having the same challenges. They think they're isolated and they're living in a bubble and it's, they're the only ones having that challenge. So I suspect a lot of the viewers have the same or similar challenges. And I suspect that by following Sarah in her journey, wherever it goes, people can relate to it. And they'll be able to say, yeah, that's me. That's a part of me being portrayed there on the screen. That's a part of what I'm going through. And maybe it's not exact, but I can relate to that. I can get some benefit from that. I can take from Sarah's example of pain and hopefully triumph, and I can go along for that hero's journey with her, or at least empathize with her and, and get some insight that uh, I'm not alone in, in what I'm going through. Because a lot of people are facing financial hardships, and that's not related to any one economic period of time. That's all the time. There's always somebody who's going through economic hardships, and it's more popular than a lot of us would like to admit. So. I want the viewers to realize that as we follow her through her development, through getting comfortable with having money and a few other challenges that we'll probably encounter, that you can put yourself into this and you can look at yourself in your own struggle. What's your struggle? Is it weight loss? Is it having more motivation? Is it having more confidence? Is it uh, having a better relationship? What is it? Because I think we're going to get into a lot of areas with Sarah, but even the areas we don't get into, you can realize that this is a human being a human being having struggles similar to the struggles that we all face. So join me in this journey. We're going to see where it goes. We're going to see what happens with Sarah. We're going to see what we can do. And I think it's going to be fascinating. I'm Steve G. Jones, clinical hypnotherapist, inviting you to join me on this wonderful, amazing journey. So the only thing that was holding me back was the money. It's now February, and I've held on to that $2,000 since October, which for me is really good. Like, that's hard, especially when, you know, money's tight. You know, it's hard to hang on to that money. And I'd take some out and then put more back in and try to, you know, put more in, like, as I went along. And so I'm, like, holding on to this money, and I'm like, oh, thank God, I finally get to do my attic. And then the air conditioner breaks. I'm supposed to be responsible, but... I'm not. I mean, I've been cleaning for you for how long? Like a long time, a long time off and on. A year or two. Or and something. and you know, like I always am telling you, like, oh, I don't have any money. Oh my God, I'm so desperate for money. And so there were definitely times when I was like grateful to you that you let me clean your toilet. I'm like washing your boss's underwear. Oh yeah. And socks. What's going on behind the scenes? What makes her tick? What do other people say? What you know? What are some mm -hmm. outside opinions? Especially someone who's uh, very close to her, like yourself. Sarah's financial situation is that she owes a bunch of money for school debt, um, but she finished her school. The only reason I didn't go into paint in the painting department, which is what I really want to do, is because um, the painting department is really big. It's really competitive. Like I feel like it was a total waste of money, and I'm kind of, you know, wish I didn't wouldn't have bothered <laughs> honestly going back to school because. There are certain things that, yeah, you need a degree for, but being an artist is definitely not one of them. 
I can just remember days of her waking up angry and frustrated about money and saying, I can't believe it, I got these bills I can't pay. And I'm saying, well, welcome to being an American right now, you know? Most people have bills they can't pay and they have to put them off and pay them late. I mean, that's what all these companies are making money on late fees with, you know? I'm, I'm telling you. You have absolutely no breaks. I know, I'm telling you. But, but I and I was like, whoa, nothing there. Oh my God, oh my God. And so I had to swerve and I like, boom, like up over this curb and I almost hit a mailbox and then I had to go over and like luckily the person like stopped before and like let me in and like laid on their horn. I was like, sorry, I put on my hazards or whatever. I was like, I mean, narrow escape. So you guys live right next door to each other. Right? <laughs> yeah, we live next door to each other, which is a little bit crazy because I go and, um, you know, if I, I end up trying to date somebody and I say, well, you know, I have this kind of a little bit odd situation. My, my ex-wife lives next door to me. <laughs> um, but we try, we get along pretty good. There's been a few like angry text messages about whose car is that? It's still in front of your house. It's like 11 a.m. or something like that. I'm um, having a cold day. But I did escape death twice, so I guess that's a pretty good day. Right I had to like hop a curb and I almost hit a mailbox and I almost hit a car. I mean, it was like, I barely, barely did not get the accident. I guess really to, to understand Sarah's financial situation, you have to start with, it's so much bigger than what you'd first expect. I mean, it, it goes back to the fact that when she was 16, her mother very suddenly died. Um, of an illness that was brought on by stress. Um, I hope that um, Steve will help me to let go of all the negative ideas I have associated with money. I accept the fact that money is a good thing, or it can be, because it can be used to do good things just as easily as it can be used to do bad things, and um, also to feel, my main one is feeling um, deserving of money. The interesting thing about Sarah is that she, uh, I feel that she tends to be fairly analytical and uh, just tends to um, uh, kind of take things apart and, uh, and look at them for the, uh, the logic in them. I hope that um, Steve will help me to let go of all the negative ideas I have associated with money. The interesting thing about Sarah is that she, uh, I feel that she tends to be fairly analytical and uh, just tends to um, uh, kind of take things apart and, uh, and look at them for the, uh, the logic in them. Okay, Sarah, what I'd like you to do is just close your eyes and make yourself comfortable and realize that during this session you can move around if you want, if you need to scratch anywhere you can. If you need to move your body, you can. It won't affect anything. Hold it. Open your mouth slightly and exhale slowly when you're ready. Good. And when you're ready, another deep breath through your nose. Now one. The sun is set completely on the horizon and you are completely relaxed. And because you are relaxed and at ease, you realize that your mind is open, open to positive change. You'll have an abundance of money. Imagine seeing a bank account with a certain number, an amount of money that you will have. This is extra money. I'd like you now to emotionally explore some of the things in your mind that you feel in the past have stood between you and abundant wealth. So there are reasons emotionally so I want you to tune in now, feel in your heart what has been causing this. Just let any feelings associated with money come to the surface. I felt a lot that, uh, that I didn't deserve to have extra money because there are so many people in the world who are struggling and starving and I just felt like it was unfair and um, I also um, were kind of trained to think that money is bad and it's evil and if, you know if someone says oh I love money I think money is great and 
and sometimes other people will say, you know, God, what a jerk, or, you know, all they care about is money. So you feel negatively toward rich people? I, I mean, in, off, in, off the top of my head, yeah, like, my instant reaction is that, but... You were going to be there for people, you were going to be able to provide jobs for them, you're going to be able to provide money for them and hope for them because you open your heart and your mind to the idea of having unlimited wealth because you realize that what you will do with your wealth is amazing and wonderful and beautiful and helpful and necessary. Judge away, viewers, see if I care. The idea was to buy the house and rent it out so that I could, so that I didn't have to have a day job so that I could paint and be an artist. So, um, but it turns out having, you know, this house is kind of like having a day job because it's a lot of work and it's really hard to keep full because I'm doing it room by room, month to month. And so, um, but now I live here too because I broke up with Jonathan because we used to live next door. John's house is next door. That's where I used to live, but then we broke up and I didn't have anywhere to go, so that's why I'm living in like the living room of this, which obviously this is not a bedroom. I mean, you guys walked in the front door to my room and like the mail comes in, you know, the slot to my bedroom, so, but I didn't have anywhere to go, so I kind of didn't have a choice. So I just made this my bedroom. So this is why the attic is so important because I don't want to live like this anymore. It's ridiculous. Everyone's here, they can have their living room bag, they can come through the front door of their own house. Hey, it's just put an right, it's an app, or I should reach you in. I was gonna do a really cool tile backsplash because I used to do mosaic, but I just haven't had the time or the money. <laughs> this thing was handmade by this crazy person that used to live here that I had to throw out because he went nuts on Christmas Eve and um, like smashed a bunch of furniture and beer bottles and like had a, we came home and there was like a knife stabbed in our back porch and then the neighbors were like, who is that screaming in your backyard about I'm gonna kill somebody? And we were like, whoa, on Christmas Eve. So we had to kick him out on Christmas. Our- Did the roach to scare away all the other roaches? Our, our roach, <laughs> but wait, it gets better, ready? <laughs> uh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. But I thought maybe he'd scare away the real ones because he's so big, but I don't know if we're going to have any such luck. So Sarah is your landlord, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, tell us how that is. How's, what's it like to, to live with her? And, you know, the, is, she, is she you know pounding on your door, the rent's due, and what if you're late? And Tell me how she is as a landlord. When summer ended, I needed to find a job, and I didn't have a job for about three months. And Sarah, well, I'd, I don't know, I've been become friends with her too in the period that I've been living here. Um, so when I couldn't pay rent for a month and then two months, she was she was alright with it and we just worked it out and I paid what I could when I could and then when I finally got a job again, I got all the money back. So I guess as a landlord, she's, she's pretty awesome. Sarah, in terms of uh, you know her desire for self-improvement, uh, personal improvement, um, um, you know, as a, as a factor, who can, as a person who can be a, a motivator for other people in their lives and, and that kind of thing. It's, I don't know, I, even without without talking to her directly about it, even seeing her seeing her working on her uh, paintings and things like that is uh, is motivation to myself for not necessarily doing art but doing something that I that I enjoy. So Jason, she described to me a time that she had to you were late on the rent and she had to come into your room, get you in a headlock, <laughs> and just start wailing away until you finally conceded. <laughs> when that happened, I started locking my door every night. <laughs> so they can't. Just, put it hotter because I sometimes it's like over 75 degrees I just do that anyway um yeah this is the hallway the heater is broken like I was telling you the AC is broken turns out the AC and heat is the same thing which I didn't realize I think it's cool and you kind of score it and make your shape and then you take these and you snap it and if you're lucky it goes right along where you cut it and then you have to grind 
the edges so that <clears throat> it gives them a bit of tooth so that the foil will stick to it. Or you can like grind it to make it rounder or to get the shape right. And then you put this foil on it, which has this, it's like tape, it's got a back and it's sticky. And then you, you um, put the foil all the way around it like this. You just kind of wrap it. Yeah, that's a um, lampshade that I did. Um, yeah, you just do like each panel at a time and then put it all together. I don't know. If we do, it's going to be a long ways down the road because right now, like, I mean, we still, total, we still love each other a lot and we're very close and we're always going to be a big part of each other's lives. But as far as, like, living together and being together in a relationship I don't know if it ever did happen it would be like a while from now like years probably so this is Josephine Baker and she was um, in the 1920s she was <clears throat> the most famous woman in Europe she was a burlesque dancer and um, she was in a few movies yeah, and she also um, spied for the French resistance during the war she adopted 12 children from all over the world, like impoverished children. She called her her rainbow tribe. Okay, so this is the attic, the famous attic. As you can see, it's not finished or livable. But when I bought the house, it was already like this. It was already insulated. We framed this in. So I've been waiting two years to make that happen. Things and need to I'll be put in so they can put the sheetrock up, windows framed out. Um, like the stained glass window I'm making is going there, it needs to be framed out. I mean, I was with Sarah, and it was like, uh, you know, every day she would wake up and she would be like, I mean, it's rude of me to say this, but she would wake up pissed off. I remember one day she finds this artist that does like a painting that she really wants to have done, and she, like, she gets like, she goes, oh, what a bitch. And I'm like, why the hell would you have some negative thought? About someone else doing something, she's like, "Well, I should have invented it." And I said, "Yeah, what the hell is that? You know, you should, you, you know, you go and you appreciate what you have, and you be thankful for others and other things too." But every single day, I had to to really kind of lecture somebody time and time and time again about how to be happy, and she would um, always focus on the suffering of others and take all that in to herself and where I have a lot of empathy for other people suffering and I want to help them. If I don't take care of myself, I can't help out other people. But there was so much lesson learned hmm. in having a difficult relationship and just, you know, just going and every day saying, you got, you've got to be happy. You've got to make yourself happy. And it was just simple, simple, basic steps. It would be like, name three things that you're happy about. And if you can't, like, just off the top of your head, say, I'm happy to, for air, food, and water. You know, I mean, you can put anything in that statement, but that changes your luck because that brings you into a place of gratitude, which makes you already thankful for what you have, which then creates having more. So I look back at my life when I got out of relationship with Sarah and I was trying to piece it back together again and see like, I mean, it was so frustrating. Was like, everything was so hard because I ended up having to confirm to myself time and time again, you know, what it is that makes me happy, what it is that makes my life work. And, I mean, it, it just, that's really what it takes. It just takes every day having, it's like a, it's like a mental exercise. And I, all I can say is I'm really thankful for her, for her bringing me to that place. I mean, how else can I say it? Between Sarah and I right now is this, um, is this LAN cable right here. Mm. I, I was stealing her wireless for a long time well, with permission, but uh, then we found out that with this new TV I got, it needs to have an actual LAN cable plugged in, so instead of buying a $100 box, I just ran a cable between the houses. I think there's a story here probably about all of us. Uh, you know, Savannah is famous for this story of uh, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, and um, uh, in that, it's, it's just a whole cast of characters that are such wacky people. Do such wacky things. Idea: I was gonna make uh, furniture out of um, car parts, so the desk made from a 318i. Um, and actually, the lights light up on it, the inside of it's done up as a desk. Uh, it started out as a really fun, cool idea, but when it said it's all said and done, it took 50 hours to make it. 
So then I tried to sell on eBay for about a month and I gave up and kept it. So Steve said, yeah, he said, he said, I do hypnotherapy. And I was like, that's great. You know, but how, how do you pay your bills? And he says, no, I do hypnotherapy. Like I'm, I'm actually pretty popular on the internet. You should check out my website. And he gave me his card. They had this kind of cheesy picture. It looked like Edward Norton on it, but it was obviously him. And uh, yeah, we went to his website and we were just um, blown away about all the stuff he did. I know you're always striving for self-improvement and for deeper understandings of uh, people. I noticed that when you talk about someone, you don't just talk about the surface things. You talk about, you know, the bigger picture, what's going on with them emotionally and spiritually. But what I see you do with your hypnosis is, is right on par with so much other stuff that's going on. But it seems like it's a, it's an extremely direct way of handling um, of handling what we're all trying to do. Uh, one of the fundamental beliefs of my church is that every thought you have is a prayer. Every action you take is a prayer. Everything you're doing is a prayer. That your prayers are creating. That you are creating things yourself. Well, I realized why I had trouble with finances. That the trouble was that I wasn't being open about where I was and and what my ideas were on money. And I had to release that. So I'd like you to take a deep breath in through your nose. Hold it. Open your mouth slightly and exhale slowly. Good. And continue allowing yourself to breathe in a comfortable way. In your, and you are becoming so skilled at allowing yourself to go into hypnosis. Positive suggestions that will allow you to live your life in a new way. A way that works for you. Thoughts and feelings about you having unlimited wealth and perhaps your thoughts and feelings about you helping others through your wealth. <clears throat> um, I feel very undeserving of that. Um, and even when it's suggested to me that um, if I had all this wealth, I could help other people. I'm afraid that um, if I really did have all that money, that it would change me. I'd like you to imagine yourself having a certain amount of money in your savings account that you would consider to be a lot of money. I'd like you to tell me what that, what that number would be. Um, $100,000. Good. So imagine you have $100,000 in a savings account. A little afraid because I want to do the right thing with it. What's the right thing? Um, the right thing is to not blow it all on something frivolous and to use a part of it to do something good for someone else. With increased wealth, you can be a greater example rather than just affecting positively the people in your household you can just take yourself and exponentially affect countless people in a positive way with your example if i can start to think more that way it would be kind of what would break down whatever is i'm blocking like the wall that i'm putting up against money i guess like if i could adopt that thought pattern instead of the one I have right now, I think it would really help me be more open to receiving that kind of love. So she was, when I was interviewing her under hypnosis, uh, she was partially in hypnosis, so we we're actually talking to both minds, the conscious and subconscious minds, but I think because of that very light state, uh, we were able to get uh, some opinion and some subconscious information. Logical arguments only go so far and what we feel at the core of our being is really what makes the difference. So um, in the future we're going to have to go quite a bit deeper uh, with Sarah, quite a bit deeper into reprogramming her for success and it's also going to be an evolutionary process and I don't think she has any powerful examples right now of people in her age group who are uh, who have had or are having similar struggles.
What would be really great is if Sarah could reach out in the community and find some people who are very similar to her. You know, people who, who had it rough, uh, they were living on the edge, and then they, uh, maybe they even had an art degree, that would be great, and they found a way to, to find their passion, to tap into it, and to make something of it, and at the point at which she meets them, they'll be very successful. I think that's going to help uh, bridge the gap between a concept and what can actually be brought into reality because as I see it that's one of the main challenges right now how can this uh, wonderful concept actually be reality and I think she's having a struggle with seeing how this can never be anything more than a fairy tale females in her age group who are just a little bit ahead of her who can serve as powerful examples and I think that's what we all need in order to make it reality because our income if we want to boil it down to to money our income is an average of our friends incomes it's not all about money. It's not all about uh, getting rich. And if it were, Sarah wouldn't be interested in it anyway. It's about fulfilling yourself and fulfilling your potential. Sarah's got so much potential, as we saw today at her house, to serve as an example because she, she is a force within herself. She's a powerful personality just by the virtue of being honest and real. She's a very powerful force. And if that force could affect more lives, I think that would be wonderful. But... Yeah. Bridging that gap is, is going to be a challenge for her, so I hope she makes use of the, uh, the assets which I know are out there in the community. She just has to uh, put her feelers out there, put her intentions out there, and, and start drawing them to her. This is my car. It's a 95 Volkswagen Cabrio, and um, I got it for free because when I was married to Jonathan, he got it for like really cheap and then I had to give my truck back because I was leasing it. And then so he just like gave me this car because I didn't have one. It's like, oh my God, I didn't even, <gasps> I didn't even know that it was there until right now. So yeah, I need to fix that. And like these are, like this whole seam is silicone because it's broken and these are, and it stinks because it gets like mildewy. And then, um, so it has no heat. No speedometer, no radio, no dome light. I don't know what that's about. And like all these wires are hanging out and it's dirty, obviously. <laughs> no, I'm like a total hypocrite. I'm like this supposed like hippie driving around without a catalytic converter, which means I'm polluting twice as much as I would be if I had one. Well, free Tibet, I got that when the Tibetan monks were here making the sand mandala at the Jepson Center. My friend Sam put this on my car while I was on vacation, but it's my favorite sticker. I think it's great. Um, and uh, this is my favorite band. They're a local band in town. I'm friends with them, the Trainwrecks. They're excellent. It's just hilarious and awesome. I love the onion. Folk Me Hard, that was from this um, like kind of lesbian like um, folk music thing they had at the Sunny at Bean, and that was this girl's sticker. I grew up Catholic, not Catholic anymore. I think that's a great sticker because we should all just let each other be. Kind of equality all around, which is always good. Focus on your own damn family, Neff said. Be what you are, Neff said. May the forest be with you. This is a sticker from the Hostel in the Forest, which is a hostel in the middle of the forest, go figure, in Brunswick, Georgia. That's awesome. And it's $20 a night, and you stay in a tree house in the middle of the woods, and it includes like a free um, home-cooked like vegetarian dinner that they make from the food they grow there. It was like that when I got it. Check it out. Ooh. The reason we're going to a car dealership is because Sarah has expressed an interest in getting a better car and she mentioned that a Mercedes or BMW uh, would be good. As you can see, we're, we're in my Mercedes now <laughs> and uh, as you can see, we're in my Mercedes oh, now. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> so we're actually kind of right in the middle of a discussion, uh, me being a Republican and uh, Sarah being, I don't know, maybe she's going to convert because she's not happy with Obama right now. I so, do not uh, affiliate with any political party. They've <laughs> deepened the canal before, and every time they do, um, more of the freshwater marsh here gets contaminated by salt water. And Savannah is one of the very few places on planet Earth that even has freshwater marsh. And um, freshwater marshes contain something like 10 times more 
um, variety of species of animals and plants than saltwater marsh. So if our freshwater marsh goes away, like several, many different species may actually become extinct, if not severely endangered. Um, and if nobody cares about that, even if you're like, who cares about the animals and the delicate balance of our ecosystem on our home of planet Earth, um, even if you don't care about that, it may also um, contaminate our drinking water because the Florida aquifer is what we use here in Savannah and I'm not sure how how wide that goes, but um, it's a pretty big area that gets their drinking water from the Florida aquifer. So if suddenly that's full of salt water, guess what? We don't have any freaking drinking water. So I don't understand how that could even be on the table as a possibility because we, I, I don't, I really think that um, like more crap from China is, is not exactly necessary. Like, I mean, I guess the whole thing is just based on greed because that's the only thing they want. They want the super Panamax boats to be able to come through um, Savannah, which are just like bigger container ships. They're even bigger than the giant ones that we already have. And they're all full of, you know, crap from China, crap you buy at Walmart, whatever, crap no one needs. And, you know, so they want even bigger boats with even more crap to come through at the price of our drinking water. And so I just don't understand that. And I think it's ridiculous. Oh, and um, <clears throat> I hate to sound like an uninformed American, but I think in this case, that's what I am. I don't know anything about what Sarah just said. But uh, I am interested in learning. I'm actually not interested in learning more. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought I would say that since we're uh, filming this. Um, I actually have no interest in it whatsoever, and I, I do trust that everything will work out. But I think that uh, in the bigger picture of uh, Sarah's mind and in the, in the greater landscape of it, that um, she strongly associates with the um, with the underdog with uh, you know the little guy who's being um, picked on and is helpless and can't you know do anything so here's you know the little guy and here's the you know potentially evil government crushing the little guy is yeah, that underdog most of my life like in high school and stuff and whatever like I was always the little guy and I always got picked on but yeah I definitely have that thing like if yeah that, that, I guess that um, but I, I trust that we've got some people who live on the planet with us who are in the government. Those are the people making the decisions. So they're not going to do things that, you know, wipe us out or uh, cause widespread disease or, or anything like that that's bad for uh, the population of the planet as a whole because they live on this planet and so do their children and so will their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren and their relatives and their friends. I mean, these are people. The government is just made up of people just like us. So although I do look a lot at a lot of the um, steps they make as completely idiotic, I also realize that I as a human trying to make the best decisions would also make completely idiotic decisions every now and then. It's something is not a threat, like truly believe that it's not a threat so they don't do anything about it, but it turns out they're wrong and it is a threat and we all die. I don't know. I feel like it's more about money and less about like just the good of all. Why don't you care about animals? With the exception of my next door neighbor's dog, <laughs> uh, which barks incessantly uh, when they let it outside, it just barks at the air. And they bark at me if I try to go in my backyard. I'm not allowed in my backyard. The dog will, <laughs> dog will bark at me. So the, with the exception of that one dog in the entire universe, I, uh, I actually love animals. I, I think animals are great. However, uh, that does not equate to me um, trying to step in and tell the government that they're doing something wrong or incorrect. Because... I, I don't know all the facts. I don't, and I could become a person who knows all the facts, which which I feel that you are or are becoming. Oh, I, I don't know all the facts, definitely not. But I have a lot of problems with like fear. Jonathan used to get on me about this all the time. He, you know, I get like, I get myself all worked up and like, oh, you know, like, you know, <laughs> whenever we watch a movie together, I would always say, um, if he wanted to pick it out, I'd always say, Jonathan, okay, but no baby killing movies. Because he'd always want to watch, like, you know, Hotel Rwanda or, like, some, like, horrible, like, documentary on documentary some, like, atrocity toward humanity that I'd... And I would be, like, you know, a mess by the end and, like, in tears and, like, suicidal. And he'd be like, wow, you know, yeah, that sucks, but 
you know, just, you know, he just could do, and I'm like, how can you watch that? Like, how can you, like, deal with the fact that's going on? Like, I can't take it. Like, I can't, I can't, I'm getting, like, worked up right now just thinking about it. Like, I, I just can't, I guess I kind of take it all on myself, you know, because I can't do anything about it, and, and worse than that, even if I could, like, I don't, I don't want really to, like, drop my life and move to, I don't know, Guatemala and, like, you know, volunteer all of my free time. Like, I, I don't even really want to do that because I like, I like my comfort and I like my whatever. And that makes me feel bad about myself. And then, but, like, even if I did do that, I mean, how much could I really change, you know? And I just feel, like, really helpless and fearful and, like, because whether, you know, if Steve is wrong about all that, like, hopefully he's right. Like, I really hope that he's right and maybe he is. But if he isn't, there's nothing I can do about it. And being out of control, I can't, I have major problems being out of control, like not being able to control situations. And I just have like major, like fear, you know, of kind of big picture stuff that may or may not happen. Above the whole like cool car thing, like oh, I don't care about cars, whatever. Cars are polluting and who cares. But I'm walking around and I'm like, I want one, they're so nice. And like normally I don't do that, so I have to like admit that I'm not beyond that whole thing because I really like <laughs> just looking at them on the outside. I'm, I'm supposed to be working on like making more money and getting to a point in my life where I have like plenty of money. Mm -hmm. So pretend it's not an issue. <laughs> so but look at the sunroof. That is called the panorama sunroof. Wow. It's almost like a convertible. <laughs> it's so pretty. And of course it has Bluetooth, so you can pair your phone to the car. What? Does it have GPS or is that just the... That's navigation. Wow. It does have navigation. That, wow. That's your storage there. You also have a little thing in here just for receipts and change or whatever. Now, with this, what this will do, think about this kind of like a mouse on your computer, mm -hmm. and you can navigate the oh, screen that way. Neato. You can also navigate the screen just by pushing all these different buttons, or you can use that, which is your voice control, and you can tell it what to do. My car doesn't even have a glove box. It is roadside assistance Fabulous. for the lifetime of the vehicle. Wow. What that means is, number one, if you should have a flat tire, they will, you call them, and they will come out and take your spare, take your flat tire off, put your spare on. Mm -hmm. If your battery dies, they will come out and charge your battery. Wow. If you run out of gas, they will bring you gas to get to the nearest gas station. Wow. This is all free of charge. And it's for the lifetime of the vehicle. Damn. So if you have this car 10 years, 20 years, yeah. no matter who, then if even if you sell it, trade it, whatever, uh -huh. for the lifetime of the vehicle. Wow. And some people have Mercedes Benz for 20, 30 years. Oh, yeah, because they last, and most people, I think, that have learning again from Jonathan and all the car stuff he taught me, it's like, if you get, if you do get your hands on a used one of these, BMW, Mercedes, mm -hmm. whatever, normally they're in great shape because people that pay that amount of money for a car take care take of it. Take care of them. And they're already good cars anyways. Yeah. Oh, that one right there? Yes. Oh, is it exactly the same body? It's exactly the same body style. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. There. Well, these are their sports seat. So they're more contoured. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very happy. Which do you like best? Ones I think I like the other one. The first one. My grandfather, he lives in Spain, and um, he is like obsessed with uh, Mercedes. He always has his Mercedes. He still has one that he had. It's like a 1960-something like red Mercedes. Mm -hmm. all like, but and the one he has now, <clears throat> I think it. I mean, it's it's fairly old. It's like late early 90s, I think. But it's you know like. No food in the car and don't breathe on it wrong and don't, you know, it's like, oh, grandpa's car, you know, he just is so, he like wipes it with a diaper like every day. Yeah. It's like, don't touch the Mercedes, you know, and he keeps it for as long as he can because it's kind of cheap, but, you know, like he, he's going to get the car and he's going to keep it forever and, you know, he's just so proud of that car and he just loves it. So, I guess, I don't know, I guess kind of runs the family. You deserve this car. 
you deserve to be in this car. This car is your car. You deserve this car. This car belongs to you. And it feels right to be in this car. It feels like you're in your own car because you are. As you feel the seat, that's your seat. As you feel yourself sitting in this vehicle, this is your vehicle. All the stuff she said about safety, how these cars are built safe, and it just feels because it's like spacious and it's, um, it just, yeah, it feels good to be in this car. So it feels like, you know, I'm just not used to being around things like that or being in cars like this. So it's just, it's a little alien, I guess, you know, like it, like I, if they asked me if I wanted to test drive one, I probably would say no because I'd be too scared. <laughs> if it was my car, it wouldn't matter because, you know, it's mine, but um, yeah, I'm just not used to like luxurious, nice cars because I've never had one. I've barely ever like even ridden in one, so I'm just not used to it. new sense of ownership of this car and a new feeling that you are entitled to everything that you want in life. All you have to do is ask for it and openly receive it. Nito! Oh my God. Can I like mess with it for just a second? So I'm kind of nervous. Cause... <laughs> I don't want to mess up the pretty car. Oh. Look, it has a speedometer and everything. And another left? Left. It, you're right, they're like heavy, but like smooth and heavy. Am I okay. My brakes in my car are like almost to the floor, so I'm used to like, that's why I oh. keep doing that, just so you know, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Having, a lot of people say that. I have a brake fluid leak, actually. Actually, these guys can testify. My brakes went out when I got to their house the other day, and I had to be rescued. Look how quiet it is, you guys. It's like silent. My car's not silent. Uh -huh. Now, I will tell you, on the highway, you're probably going to get more than 26. Cool. Probably closer to 28. What? What's the little... There's like a little coffee cup. Oh! What that is, is your attention assist. So if you're driving and the car will sense if you're getting tired, a coffee <laughs> cup will show up and say, time for a cup of coffee. How does it know you're getting tired? Because you like slow down or something? Uh, it's kind of slightly erratic driving, maybe weaving a little bit. Wow. Just normally, the car senses the way you normally drive. Oh, and yeah. when it's different than that, that thing will pop up and say, time for a cup of coffee. That is... Is there a Starbucks nearby? Crazy. It's, uh, yeah, it's on. Showing it's just, I think it's just because I'm nervous. Well, it hasn't measured my normal driving yet. Whoops. <laughs> there, I'm weaving now, too. So it doesn't know what's normal. But Does that's it ever show insane. a beer? <laughs> no, it never shows a beer. <laughs> that's bad. So cool. Does this come in gold? So it's not as bad as I thought. I thought I was at first. I was like, "Oh my god, I'm so scared, and nervous. What if I like mess it up to drive it?" But it feels so good that like I'm not even nervous anymore. Can you imagine this being your car, sir? Yep. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even finish. The yep. <laughs> yes. I good. am imagining it being my car. Good. Seriously, how does it feel? It feels amazing. <laughs> Have you ever had anyone get in one of these cars and be like, I don't like it. it sucks. It's terrible. No. <laughs> no. Okay, how do you think it's different than your car? Oh god, I could do you have a few hours? Top is falling apart. It's got no working speedometer, no heat, no radio, no dome light. The lock is broken. Like I it, think you it, need a new car. Yeah. It, We're kind of trained to think that money is bad. We have all these sayings like money is the root of all evil and you know, you know, if you have a lot of money you're greedy and whatever and, um, but it's not. And it's okay to say that you like, like if you say, oh, I like money, I love money, 
and people think, oh, God, like, you're a horrible, shallow person, but, you know, maybe that's where a lot of the struggle comes in. If you, like, I mean, if that's your attitude toward money, well, I hate money and I don't want it, well, then you're not going to have any. You know, you're not going to get any. So whatever you're constantly thinking about is what you're going to get. If you're constantly, like, I don't have any money, I don't have any money, I don't have any money, then you're not going to have any money. But if you just change that and start thinking, you know, concentrating on what you do have enough money for and trying to, you know, just think about it the other way, then it really does start the flow the other way. So whenever I go up there, I'm like, I can't imagine ever actually, like, sleeping here and having, I mean, I can kind of see it finished in my mind, like, I can see, like, I want this here and I want this there, but I, I'm like, if I ever am actually, like, in a bed up there sleeping and, like, showering and using it, I'll be shocked. Like, I won't be able to believe it, because it just seems so impossible because it's been like two years and it's kind of coming along but it's so slow and it's like god will I ever get there you have to ask yourself okay it's impossible it's impossible to have that much money well why why is it impossible obviously it's not impossible because there are plenty of people that have ridiculous amounts of money that don't definitely don't deserve it you know aren't doing anything good with it so <clears throat> if you stop or if I stop and think about it there's no good reason why changing the way you think about things and just kind of your attitude toward it um, in general. Sorry, my nose is really stuck. <laughs> but it, to me, it was more kind of like a guided meditation, which I am really into anyway. I really like <clears throat> um, meditating. I think it really can change your life. And um, to have somebody, you know, do a guided one for you is really powerful. And you do, like, you do kind of go into another state, just kind of a more, I don't know. It's not like being, like, talking like I am right now, like, you are a little bit more kind of on a different level, and so you probably are, like, your, I guess your subconscious is more on the surface, maybe, and I think that does make you more susceptible to suggestion, not so much what Steve's doing, but more kind of what the person is doing who's being hypnotized, like, what they're thinking about, or how they feel about it, because, um, I think it's a lot to do with the power of suggestion, which can be a very, very powerful thing, and if that's how it works, that's okay, it doesn't mean it doesn't work, just because, you know, you can't turn a total skeptic into a, you know, have like something. Well, maybe you can. I don't know. Maybe people who are skeptical will walk away saying, wow, that's amazing. I never thought. I mean, that's possible too. But um, I'm just saying that was kind of all in your mind, just like everything. <laughs> so... In an early episode, Sarah, it came up, I think from your ex-husband, that your mom had passed away. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the viewers wrote in and wanted to know how the passing of your mom affected your uh, future. We never had to, like, we couldn't afford to, whatever. We bought our clothes at Goodwill and Kmart, and maybe once a year for back to school we'd get an outfit from, like, JCPenney if we were good, you know. But anyway, so... So and maybe I inherited some of that mindset, you know, like, I can't afford it, I can't afford it, I don't have enough, I don't have enough. Um, but and as far as relationship-wise, it, yeah, majorly affected my life as far as having relationships with other people, because, especially romantic relationships, because what I realized happened was, because my, my, my parents were divorced, my father had moved out, and then, like, a year later, she died. And I was 16, and I had a 7-year-old sister, or a nine-year-old sister so uh and I didn't realize you don't realize when you're that age that like how much you depend on your parents especially your mother especially if your dad isn't there like and so to have that instantly taken away you're like you know I just realized oh my god like this person was my whole life and now they're gone I was not in control and, and that was when I realized that anything can happen at any time like because we thought she had the flu two weeks later we were pulling her off life support so it was just instant, it didn't make any sense, and that and that really like shook me in the way that I view things, and it put a lot of fear into me, like, oh my god, anything can happen at any time, there's nothing I can do about it. I kind of like, haha god thing was like, well, I'll just never be close to anyone again, because then they can't be taken away from me, so there, you know? Yeah. So that's what I did, and I was like, I don't want a boyfriend, I don't want anyone, you know, close to me, because that's my way of controlling it, you know? If there's no one that important to me, then I can't get hurt, they can't be taken away, you know, haha, -ha, now I'm back in control. So 
So we had a great season. Uh, we followed Sarah, my cleaning person and my friend, through her growth as an individual and her struggles. And one of the things I was hoping we would get out of the season is uh, just an insight into struggles in general because not all of us are having financial challenges or or relationship challenges or, or anything else that Sarah's facing per se, but we can all get a little bit from that. We can all look at that and say, hey, there's a little bit of me in there. There's a little bit of my struggle in there. There's a little bit of my journey in there. So watching Sarah's hero's journey, if you will, from from where she started to, to a little further along in the path was fascinating for me. And uh, although we didn't see a, a complete resolution of all of her challenges, uh, if you think about it, we never do in life. We never see someone go to total perfection in their lives. We see them enjoying the journey along the way and the growth that comes from that, and the insights that come from that. So hopefully in future seasons, we'll check in with Sarah. We'll find out where she's at further down the line. We'll find out uh, what's going on with her and we'll see some improvements. But what I have seen uh, for right now that I'd like to remark on, I've seen just some amazing uh, insights that she has now. Just some, some really uh, good uh, insights that she's had that have to do with seeds having been planted in her subconscious mind. Seeds that will come to fruition eventually, but for right now are just so powerful. And uh, in the wrap up that I, that I watched with Sarah, I saw her talking positively about money. I saw her talking positively about opportunities. I saw her talking about uh, concepts such as, you know, it's all in your mind. She has those insights now. So I feel that the hypnotherapy and us uh, working with her and following her and just kind of shining a spotlight on what's going on in her life and sometimes a microscope really zooming in, I think all of that has really paid off for her because now she's more aware of her self-talk. Now she's more aware of her possibilities and because of that, we all benefit. We all get something from that. We all get to say, you know, hey, there's a little bit of me in there. Whatever I'm going through, I know that I'm not alone. And I know that there are other people who are going through struggles. And I know that, uh, that I can change my thinking. And so whatever I, the viewer, am going through, this is what I was hoping to get out of the season, and we got that. Whatever I, the viewer, am going through, I can look at Sarah and say, Hey, you know, if she can do it, I can do it. She's human, I'm human. She's going through struggles, I'm going through struggles. So there's a support network I can reach out to. There are possibilities that I can grab onto and I can start expanding my, my vision. I can start expanding my dreams. I can start thinking beyond this, this 